Julia Hanfling is a medical nutritionist and diabetes hypertension educator with over 20 years of experience offering comprehensive nutritional guidance and support to healthcare teams working with chronic disease patients. She's the founder of Three Peaches Nutrition and Diabetes Coaching, utilizing an approach that treats patients with compassion and as individuals. She also organizes the monthly Hawthorne Diabetes Group for anybody that's impacted by diabetes. Please join me in welcoming Julia Hanflick. Thank you. Hi, thank you. I call my business Three Peaches Nutrition and Diabetes Coaching because I just think that the changes that we recommend for our patients should be as delicious as August peaches, and I love peaches. So if you can find ways to have your patients actually enjoy the process of what you're teaching them or changes that you're encouraging, then you have a buy-in. And so look for ways for them to kind of savor your recommendations. And we'll talk about some specific ways to do that. I would say there's really two different areas that I want to talk with you about. Um, a few different things. Let's go through the objectives. We'll recognize who's at risk of hypertension, looking at the difference between the role of uh, sodium for high blood pressure. We'll address three dietary recommendation systems, both the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, and I'm gonna add in some guidelines for anti-inflammation as well, since there's more um, research and um, discussion about this now. We'll look at the importance of lifestyle factors, um, understand the learning style of different patients, and also to support your role as an educator. And this is one thing I think is very important. I want to be able to give you tools and resources and tips and ideas for how to take care of your patients, but what I'd also like to do is to give you some guidelines for you to take care of yourself so that you're an example for the patients that you're talking to. So here's a couple considerations. Um, so the uncontrolled factors are gonna be both age, race. We know that, um, as we discussed earlier, African Americans tend to have higher blood pressure. Same is true for the Native Americans and the Hispanic population. Um, family history is a huge consideration, but some of the controllable factors are gonna be low physical activity, um, a high sodium, low potassium um, diet, as well as other dietary considerations, a person's weight, um, stress, poor sleep, and tobacco. So let's take a look at just what are some of the DASH um, guidelines. And I would say in your packet, there's some links um, to websites that have good resources that are available for you. So you'll see a lot of these as resources for your, later on. So the DASH diet stands for um, the Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. It was developed uh, by the National Heart, um, Lung, and Blood Association and, or Institute in 2001, and it's been widely researched and expanded and is really quite reliable as one of the most effective tools for helping people um, lower blood pressure in a very realistic way. Fortunately, there's all sorts of other benefits as well besides just blood pressure, and I'm partial for things where you get more benefit for your um, effort. So there's two components of the DASH diet. This is gonna be both to reduce sodium. The recommendation is to cut down to 2,400 um, milligrams per day or 1,500 milligrams for additional benefits, especially for people with diabetes. The second component will be the dietary modifications of having higher fruits and vegetables, um, looking at low-fat milk products, whole grains, fish, poultry, beans, um, and seeds. Um, less sugar and fats, red beets, and you know, there's not that many products now that have trans fats in them that's been actually um, ruled out. There's another consideration that we'll come to later, but looking at lower fat, lower cholesterol, and then higher in potassium, magnesium, calcium, protein, and fibers too. So we know that sodium decrease um, is effective both for prehypertension as well as hypertension, and to add the dietary component um, has additional benefits. So um, I'd like you to keep in mind that they're separate, but they certainly overlap. And um, this is actually effective even without any change in body weight. So though if there's an add a weight component to it too, a weight loss, then that can be additionally effective. So we looked at some of what the limitations and the um, recommendations and limits are here. And um, 
let's see, we know, here's a guy, having sodium on his uh, potato there. I have a friend who um, always salts his food before he tastes it. And so he's over, and it really kind of annoys me because I will cook dinner, I'm making it just the way that I think it tastes really good, and then he'll add extra salt. So he and his wife come over and we're having dinner, and so I plate everything up in the kitchen and I just add extra salt to his to start with. So I serve this out, he's already got his extra salt on, and he adds more salt before tasting it. And um, he tastes this, it goes, wow, this is really too salty. And I said, yes, if you just get your patients to taste their food before they add salt, that in itself will make a big difference. So I thought it was pretty funny myself. Are still friends? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are still friends, but he always tastes my food first. <laughs> um, the average American gets between 34 and 4,800 milligrams per day. Um, we know that one teaspoon will be 2,400 milligrams, and um, the um, recommendation uh, breaks out to about 600 milligrams per meal. This can be a useful piece of information when you're having your patients look at labels. So it's targeting about 600 per meal, and then there's always some slack for chips, whatever it is. Okay, there's eight food groups that continue, uh, contribute 40% of the average sodium intake, and this will be both candid dried soups, um, canned vegetables, pasta dishes, pizza, cold cuts, um, chips and pretzels, breads and commercially fried foods. So here's some ways to reduce sodium. These include using <coughs> frozen or fresh vegetables instead of canned, um, garlic or onion powder, not garlic or onion salt. Many people don't realize that there is a difference, but for those with hypertension, the difference is quite significant. I'm using half the seasoning package. This is especially beneficial for people with a very low income because if they're using top ramen noodles or other prepackaged box foods with very little cooking skills, if they just use half the package, um, then their food can still taste good, but it doesn't impact their blood pressure in such a way. It's a very simple um, recommendation. Um, using a low sodium soy sauce. Um, adding salt in the cooking process and not at the table. And I recognize too that people who salt their food at the table, that only has to do with their comfort. They're afraid their food won't taste good without it. Why not the other way? Why not at the table and not at the cooking process? It, it seems like it's, it's more controlled to at the table. Yes, that's, she's asking, um, it's, it's more controllable at the table if a person adds salt then. That's true, but if people get their food that tastes quite bland and doesn't have enough salt to reach the, a satisfaction point, then typically they won't eat it. And so I, we lose people's overall nutrition that way. It's kind of funny. Still a good recommendation, though. Okay, using herbs and spices, um, including curry, garlic, basil, cinnamon, cumin, and others. And right now, one of the darlings of the spice world is turmeric, right? So how many people have added turmeric in what they're doing? Sure, that this has all sorts of anti-inflammatory benefits and it has really great flavor. I would say that if you're using both um, ginger and turmeric, um, that one way to get flavor out of these is to grate them. But I found out that if you freeze um, ginger, or freeze, yeah, ginger and freeze your turmeric and then grate it, it grates beautifully and it doesn't get moldy in your vegetable drawer. So if you freeze those, you'll be doing fine. I know, fun facts to know and tell, right? Okay, too much salt masks other flavors. Um, it's very important that food tastes good, otherwise the rec recommendation to reduce sodium won't last. Um, we know that the taste buds can change, and they do change, um, and they can adapt to a lower sodium intake. This is interesting that we know that for a person who cuts way down on the sodium that they're taking in, that it takes about two to three weeks for the taste buds to change, and the term for it is the taste buds bloom or blossom, and they actually have all these other flavors that are suddenly available once the sodium is no longer um, on the plate. So you can remind your patients that the taste, their taste buds will change to be able to take in more flavor after a pe short period of time. And the most important thing is just let your patients know that they will still enjoy their food. Okay, so watch for sodium on a label. And I would like to recommend that you keep some um, tools and supplies in your office. 
I didn't ask, how many people here are registered nurses? Okay, and how many are MAs or other office? And um, EMTs? Um, anybody else? Behavioral health, excellent, okay, great. Well, um, this is one thing that I would ask that you keep in your office, and it could look like this. I'm actually gonna pass this very label around. This is a can of soup. Now, many people would say grab a can of soup, open up the whole thing, have that for lunch, right? That would be a common thing. So, um, but I'm gonna pass this and have you take a look at what's here. We know that this is gonna say, I'm gonna come over here, that um, there's gonna be 990 milligrams of sodium in this package. Interestingly enough, um, we do know too that if you're get, trying to get say 2,400 milligrams a day, 990 is a fairly significant amount of that. But, yes, can you say that louder? There are two servings in there. That's considered two servings. So there's actually a, th a 1,990 um, milligrams of sodium, so, or 1,980. So if you're trying to get um, 2,400 for the whole day and one can has almost 2,000 milligrams in itself, then that's a huge percentage and contributes to the higher sodium intake overall. So when you're looking at a label, encourage your patients to actually look at the serving size they actually eat, not just what's on the label. There's a difference between a serving size and a portion size. And let me tell you the difference between a serving and a portion. So a serving size is standardized. This is the standard right here. But so a serving size is standardized, a portion is personal. So if they have twice that much, if they have half that much, you have to show how to adjust the actual intake for what's on the label. Okay, let's talk about potassium. We do know that as well, sodium tends to pull uh, water inside the cells and potassium tends to work opposite and um, pull it back into the interstitial fluids. Um, the recommendation is to get about 4,700 milligrams per day, or roughly 1,000 mil uh, milligrams per meal. And the average intake is only 1,800 per day. So it's much lower than what a person actually needs. And of course, this is something that would have to be modified depending on the medications that a person is taking. But most people um, do need to increase the potassium. Okay, so here's some high potassium foods. These include uh, white beans, avocados, um, acorn squash, spinach, baked potato, banana, yogurt, salmon. Um, you do wanna consider produce that has bright colors um, and be careful with salt substitutes that can be unplanned potassium. But when we're talking about bright colors in your food, say they say eat a rainbow and it's a wonderful advice. However, blue Kool-Aid does not constitute a <laughs> potassium source. Okay, I'd like to look at the Mediterranean diet. That's actually what fits under the DASH diet component. With the Mediterranean diet, it builds on the same information and expands it in another way. Um, we're looking here, it's accredited to Walter Willett out of Harvard in 1994. Um, it's based on patterns of Crete, typical uh, Crete, Greece, and Southern Italy in the early 60s and includes regular physical activity. I would say that today, the typical diet in the Mediterranean region does not actually follow the Mediterranean diet per se because so much of the dietary changes that have come about there are increasing McDonald's, increasing Western American style food, and their health is compromised now because they've lost some of the traditional foods. Um, Personally, I would say if in doubt, um, look toward the traditional foods from around the world because there's some really wonderful benefits that we have from, um, that we could learn from other parts of the world over time. And this also includes regular physical activity. What is that defined as? Regular physical activity. I'm thinking of the early 1960s. Was it a lot of walking? Or a lot of walking, a lot of people ride activity? bikes. Um, working hard physically, um, fishing and others. Yeah, and I mean, they're not going to the gym in the early 1960s. They're not going yeah. to the gym, no. Uh -uh. No, it's working into regular lifestyle. And we're, that's a really good question. I'm gonna answer that a little bit farther down. Okay, so the Mediterranean <laughs> basics are um, um, vegetables, either fresh or frozen, whole fruits, grains, beans and peas, um, good fats, oil-rich fish, unprocessed meat and eggs, um, cultured whole dairy, um, and a glass or two of wine per day. And it's limiting uh, vegetables, sugary drinks, refined grains, um, limiting fried foods, uh, processed meats, and also fake foods. 
Um, Okay, it's similar to the DASH diet, but it adds the following recommendations, which is including healthy oils, the omega-3 fatty acids, um, EPA and e, uh, DHA, especially olive oil and salmon, um, and other oily fishes. Let's see, modest amounts of dark chocolate makes many people very happy. Um, one to two glasses of wine or other alcohol in moderation. Um, a whole, it's just interesting, um, cultured um, milk, such as yogurt and kefir, in place of skim or 1% milk, so there is a difference between the two there. Um, and physical activity is considered a vital part. I'd like to come just for a moment to have, yes? Um, is there a substitute for the wine or alcohol? Some people might have an addiction problem. Like juice, yes. The recommendation is just to leave that off, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say that the initial research showing the benefits of um, alcohol came specifically through red wine, and it was funded by the California Wine Institute. Okay. I would like to, tr yes. Yeah. Oh, I. I okay, I would like to track down when there's research claims who's funding the research. It's a really important question to ask. On that same note, the chocolate recommendations were funded by Hershey's. So, okay, you had a question. Kefir? Kefir. Kefir is um, similar to yogurt. It's actually more as a drink. Um, they sell it at every major grocery store now. Um, the plain yogurt, plain kefir will have the, best, the most benefit. Typically it'll have fruit added to it, so it may be like peach flavor or raspberry or whatever else. And then when they add flavor and fruit to it, then they add a ton of sugar to go with it. Right. So, But many people find that the flavor of the um, plain yogurt is very bitter. And if adding fruit buys some cooperation, it means that they're going to get some additional yogurt and kefir. That's a good thing. OK, um, I'd like to look at the sources of the omega-3 fatty acids. Typically, it would include both olives and olive oil, the oily fishes, salmon and mackerel, um, other ones, um, nuts, walnuts, almonds, hazelnuts, pecans, seeds, especially sunflower, um, sesame, and pumpkin. Pumpkin is the highest um, source of magnesium in a person's diet typically. So if you like pumpkin seeds, they're your good friend. Um, I would include avocados and also canola oil. Um, about, oh gosh, it was probably 15, 18 years ago, that there was a major article, uh, or some research that went into being published um, showing the benefits of both hazelnuts, which the, is the wild version of filberts, they're the same, but hazelnuts sounds better. So they say hazelnuts and walnuts, and suddenly the Oregon nut growers are in heaven, their stock goes up, and they're very happy. And it's borne out through research, so. Um, uh, seed recommendations, are those for raw seeds? Or I, I assume they're not talking to some flower seeds that are toasted and seasoned with salt and <laughs> ranch and barbecue, or is it just yeah, he's asking whether this is a recommendation for raw nuts and seeds. And I would say yes. If they're dry roasted, then um, the oils are not lost. But typically, nuts, you know, if you buy a can of planters or something, it's got a boatload of salt added to it, which can undo a lot of the benefit, definitely. What about flaxseed oil? Is that helpful? Flaxseed oil is wonderful. We now know that flax has additional benefits besides the oil, you know, by having the soluble fibers that can go with it. And I have to say, I think that you're right. I think I should add flax to this list here. Thank well, you. Then, um, ground. And ground yeah, flaxseed is... It, <laughs> it's not ground. That she's saying that flaxseed ground is actually better than the flax seeds whole, which is true because it will go out like it goes in. So if you grind it, that actually you get the best benefit from fl flax when it's ground. Thank you. Okay, so which foods to focus on? Um, these won't be a surprise, I'm sure. They come from lots of um, different directions in terms of a recommendation of legumes, whole grains, dairies, fruits, and vegetables, um, produce, um, extra virgin olive oil, and other nuts. Which foods to limit? Interestingly enough, this right here, the bliss point, the bliss point is a balance of sugar, salt, and fat. And it's considered an ideal combination because the brain cannot really focus on salty things and sweet things at the same time. This was developed by Doritos, for Doritos, in 1957. And what they find is that when you get a perfect balance of sugar, salt, and fat, it makes people eat more. It is not a bliss point for you. It's a bliss point for the manufacturer 
but it is called the Bliss Point. And now you see honey baked ham, you see ma maple glazed um, donuts, you see bacon on donuts. Why would you put bacon on donuts, you know, or bacon in ice cream? It's because it reaches that sugar, salt, and fat. It's why they put sugar in spaghetti sauce. So be aware of that. Interestingly enough, too, that if you have, um, let me just show you here. Okay, I really like toys in my office, so <laughs> you get some of my toys here. And I would encourage you to get your own toys in your office, too. That um, if you have, let me just pull this out here, some soda, it would be this size. I know I have a beginning here. There it is. Um, that I just want to show you how much, how many sugar packs are in one drink. Now this is going to be 32 ounces and I've accommodated for a cup of ice, okay? And would you stand up and give me a hand? Yeah. <coughs> so I have to go over here and if you would just pull that out. Seriously, there are 20 packs of sugar, 21 packs of sugar for 24 ounces of pop. And this is true whether it's 7-Up or Sprite or Pepsi or whatever it is. And I'm going to pass this around so you can see for yourself. So just think about it. You may as just what, open these packages, add water, and stir because there's nothing else in it, a little caramel color or something like that. So let me just pass this out here. And I want to show you another way of looking at it. Maybe you think, well, I wouldn't drink that much. You know, I have a smaller amount. So, okay, so here's a 16-ounce container, and I have five tubes of sugar in it. And if you think about it, I'm going to pass this one, too, if you would. If you think about it, if you spill this on your hand, it would be sticky, right? Well, if it's sticky on the outside, it is sticky on the inside, and it needs to be rinsed out. So keep one of these in your office. It changes the dynamic. You're not telling your patients, don't drink this. Just showing them and let them go, ooh, and they can make their own decision. You can take those out if you want, yeah. What's that? Each two. Well, um, I don't remember exactly the calculation on this, but on the label it says, I looked it up again last night just to make sure my numbers were correct, but like one can of pop is going to. It's going to have 41 um, grams of sugar in um, a 12 ounce container. So, and there's four grams in each packet, so that'd be four pack, uh, that'd be 10 packets in a 12 ounce can of pop. I would mention that Care Oregon has this fabulous program about educating patients on food um, and overall, overall uh, health and well-being. There's cooking matters classes, some curative nutrition, uh, prenatal healthy eating classes, and a gleaning collaborative. So I would say make use of what Care Oregon has to offer through the Food Rx program. And I think that you won't have trouble finding more information about this. I think it's quite exciting. Is that a referral program too, or can they, do you have a relationship <coughs> that? Is that a referral program? Paul. I believe it's not. I think it's right on our, our website. Right? I think it is too, Some of yeah. it is referral, like the curative nutrition is referral. Some of it will be by referral yeah. if it's specific. Curative nutrition is for people with stalled wounds, uh, so it's high protein, uh, it's, it, so it is by referral. Uh, okay. For anyone who's qualified for it by having stalled wounds. And I'm sure the, Prenatal the, healthy the, eating is right. specific. But the so. Cooking Matters classes go about every six to eight weeks. It's a six weeks class, and they just, if you miss one, you can send the other. And you just need to be a Care Oregon member. That's all. They'll provide bus passes. It's at the Fred Myers on 21st ish and Burns West. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right. The stadium one. The stadium for Myers, yeah. I just want to repeat what you said for those who are at a distance, um, and that is that the um, Cooking Matters classes repeats every six to eight weeks. If you miss one, you can pick it up next time. It's for Care Oregon participants, and um, Care Oregon can also provide support for transportation. So for anyone who's on a Care Oregon plan. We'll go home with a bag of groceries too, so it helps for people who are food insecure. Oh, and she's adding that um, people go home with a bag of groceries for those who are food insecure. And absolutely, what we want to do is to make sure the recommendations that we're providing for our patients can fit their budget, can fit their taste buds, as well as their overall health picture. Okay, so how big is your plate? Here's a consideration. 
Here's another toy I'm going to ask you to keep in your office. I like using something very graphic. So if you have a plate like this, and all of us have seen these guidelines that says get half your plate as vegetables, quarter protein, quarter carbohydrates, I don't find that to be realistic. But I do find it to be more realistic that if they have a good protein foundation of some kind, get some um, vegetables over on this part, and then carbohydrates fit over here. Um, and the carbohydrates, it's important to have them recognize that would include the starchy foods, bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, cereals, corn, things like that, as well as fruit, milk, and sweets. And if that fits into a third of their plate, then they actually can do pretty well. Um, I would say there's a woman who came, I'm going to pass this to, there's a woman who came to see me for, um, she was, I just started her on insulin, she's um, 42 years old, and she's going to a family reunion, and had no clue what to bring. So we talked this through, and what she decided is that she was going to bring some um, green beans with almonds, because she really liked green beans with almonds. And whenever you go to potluck, have your patients bring something that they actually will eat as kind of like a safe food. And then she did just what we talked about. So she looked over the entire plate, or the hot, entire table, before she got her plate out. And so, am I walking around too much here? <laughs> okay, good. So um, once she had already decided what she was going to get, then she could avoid the thing that you take some of this and then, oh yeah, that looks really good and suddenly your plate is this big. So she got some, her green beans with almonds, got some coleslaw, had a uh, little caprese salad for her vegetables, got also some, um, uh, they had a rice salad that looked pretty good to her and a small amount of her aunt's pasta salad because what she really wanted was the blueberry pie at the end of the line and she'd already decided on that. And so she knew exactly how to maneuver the amounts and then got some salmon with um, uh, lemon sauce and um, some chicken that had the skin taken off. Um, and so by the time she got down to the end, she knew that her plate was going for one third, one third. And so she got her blueberry pie, had a little bit of whipped cream on it, skipped the ice cream. And just for her, her blood sugar was 138 two hours later. I thought she was going to dance on the ceiling because she was doing it in a way that made sense. She got everything that she wanted, but she also could keep in a way that was keeping her health. So if you're looking at a plate about one third, one third, one third, that will help your patients a great deal. Okay, times have changed. I think this is important. It says in 1980, 75% of the calories that people ate came from food, came from meals, and about 25% came from snacks. But look what happened. In 2010, 40% of the calories now come from meals, and 60% come from snacks. I think this is a direct result from our dieting efforts. Because we say eat less food at your meal, have your meals be smaller, people are hungry, and so they tend to eat more um, at other times. So I think that's a real loss. It's kind of the shadow side of the, our dieting efforts. Yes? Not only that, but in terms of nutritional value, food has less nutrition in it. So when you're eating it, you're still hungry because it has less nutrition, at least for the processed food. For the, yes, we, people typically have more processed foods as snacks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. So, I encourage um, your patients to eat more at meal times in order to lose weight and get a grip on their health, and then eat less um, between meals as snacks. And that waistline will thank you. Interestingly enough, with the anti-inflammatory guidelines now, the recommendation is to be able to go for a longer period of time between eating episodes in order that the gut can have a chance to kind of repair itself and have the peristalsis, the gut motility is a very important component. So is that even during the day? I've heard that um, overnight, like kind of the 12 hour fasting period overnight for inflammation, but even during the day between meals? Because from a metabolic standpoint, it seems like that kind of eating three solid meals, but then the snacking in between to kind of regulate metabolism and blood sugar is advantageous. Is that not the case? Um, well, here's a consideration. If lunch is at 1 o'clock and dinner is at 5 o'clock, then you probably don't need an afternoon snack. But if lunch is at noon and dinner is not till 7, that snack is very important. So if you go, you know, say two to three hours, certainly with, between meals, then, or between eating, then that actually helps the gut process food better. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, what about, I don't know if this follows with the Mediterranean diet, but uh, other countries, they tend to eat their larger meals in the afternoon or morning. Is that correct? 
Many of them do. She's asking if, and he's asking if the um, other countries tend to eat larger meals in the middle of the day. And that is true in many countries. And of course, then they take a siesta afterwards, which doesn't really fit into our work mode here. Um, but even if your dinner is the largest meal of the day, then it could still be in proportion to other meals. For example, if I have, I'm going to borrow your notebook here for just a second. So if I have basically half my food comes from breakfast and lunch, and the other half comes from dinner and snacks, dinner may still be the biggest meal, but it's going to be in proportion to what else is around there. Now, one woman, I was trying to get her to get this idea that right now she's eating one meal that goes from 4 until 10, and um, it was continuous. And I said, well, I want you to you know, eat as much in the morning as you do in the evening. And she looked at me and she says, I couldn't possibly eat that much. <laughs> so I actually meant split it. So be sure that your patients hear what it is that your message, yeah, you're saying. There was another question. Yes? Um, I wanted to know, like, so say for instance, like some days I work until 7 and my family expect me to cook. What would be good for us to eat um, at night if I'm working that late? We That's a good a question. But sure. Okay, so she's asking that if she works late, doesn't get home till 7, her family expects her to cook dinner, um, then there's actually a couple recommendations. One is encourage your family to cook dinner once a week and get them going, and I would use an instant pot you know, <laughs> or a crock pot. And thank you, Chris Blem, for showing me what an instant pot is. He uses one. <laughs> so an instant pot is a programmable crock pot. And so you could put these things in in the morning, have come home, and it would be have dinner on the table in 10 minutes. I would say, too, there's a chef. Huh? They have remote ones. And they have remote ones, yeah. yeah. They're great. Yeah, I, I don't have one, there's also a chef that I work with, <laughs> who has a very, um, a very uh, successful restaurant. And his wife, they have small kids. His wife thinks that he should cook, OK? So what he does is that he cuts his vegetables on Sundays and Thursdays. And so he'll get all his onions chopped up, not all of them, but most of them, the hard ones. The onions and celery and carrots and bell peppers and these other cabbage, he'll have these all cut up Sundays and Thursdays, run through his you know, food processor twice a week. And then he could come home from work, throw some veggies in a pan, throw chicken in a pan, add a sauce, and he'll have dinner on in 20 minutes. So a little bit of planning ahead can really help with that. So try that as well. OK, some food for thought. And that is that a snack is smaller than a meal and it's nourishing. And a treat is entertainment for your mouth. They are not the same thing. So having an evening snack can actually help to stabilize morning blood sugar. If you have some cottage cheese and peaches, or you know I was going to work those peaches in there somehow, um, or having half a turkey sandwich, or something that really nourishes you. Um, but you know, a pint of haagen is not a snack, that's a treat. So t you can show your dis uh, patients the difference there. I want to look at some other lifestyle considerations here. Um, good. OK. I'd say move more daily. Um, get a good night's sleep. Um, <coughs> lose excess weight, um, inches in the waist. Losing weight can help. Um, relax and uh, reduce stress. Uh, drink water and get a dog and other stress reductions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> or a cat, yes. Um, or who knows, a goldfish. So I would like to spend a little, bit of a little bit of time on this slide here. When it comes to activity, there are several things that can be very beneficial. We certainly know that you know, going for a walk is a great idea, and doing other cardiac or aerobic activities. Um, weight training or resistance is very valuable. Stretching or yoga and core strengthening. Um, I'd like to look at it this way. So when you're doing aerobic exercise, that gets your heart going, and it, it, it really strengthens the heart muscle itself. It also encourages the blood vessels to pump harder and then relax. And so um, we know that exercise is tremendously beneficial for lowering blood pressure, as well as um, lowering cholesterol, blood sugar, um, reducing risk of cancers, and other things too. So that's the heart impact. The weight training or resistance not everybody's going to go to the gym and work out. I mean, I hope they don't. Um, but if you actually keep some bands in your office and show your patients how to use these bands. I, I provide these for my patients in my office. So just to show them how many different ways there are to use bands or to um, you know, have their feet involved, then the resistance builds up the muscle integrity. And it helps to decrease the fat that be between the muscle fibers. So 
cardiac, strengthen your heart, aerobics. The resistance, um, I prefer people, I'll pass this too, I prefer that people practice using lower weights for more repetitions rather than higher weights for fewer repetitions. The stretching or yoga, what that does is that it tends to lengthen the um, muscle fibers and it connects the muscle to muscle as well as the muscle to bone. And um, so the stretching is tremendously beneficial, especially for helping to minimize injury. And then core strengthening has to do with balance or Pilates. Um, here's something to think about, and that is that I would ask you to teach your patients to do how to do two things, which they've been doing a long time and they probably think they're good at it. I'm gonna ask you to teach them how to stand, and I'm gonna ask you to teach them how to walk. And I'd like to practice on you right now. So why don't you stand up? And the all-American way of standing is to um, kind of point your toes in and lock your knees. Um, and when you lock your knees, then it pushes your butt out, stomach can hang down, and shoulders slouch. This is kind of an all-American way of standing. So I'm have you practice that right now. Good, I don't know if you can still see me there. All right, and the counterbalance for that is to shift your toes so the toes are slightly out farther than your heels, yes. And then if you bend just a little bit, just soften your knees a little bit. I'm gonna, I'll stand over here. Um, by softening your knees a little bit, that takes some of the pressure off of your back. And if you can, try, um, well, let's just stand here for a second. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is to pick up your left heel and pick up your right heel. And now do the same thing without moving your shoulders. When you do that, that helps to engage your core. That helps you engage your, your pelvic floor muscles there. Okay, so now one way to look at this is that if, you're, if your butt is kind of tucked under and your stomach is pulled in, then I'm still using my right leg and left leg and my left heel, then that in itself really strengthens your core muscles. You can do this standing in line at Safeway. You can do it waiting in the lobby for the elevator. You can do it while you're brushing your teeth. So if you show your patients how to stand, that's really beneficial. Another consideration is by having your shoulders back and actually using your upper chest here. One lady says, I'm putting my heart to the sky. It was so sweet. So that encourages you to breathe more. Now, one thought is if you imagine that between your butt cheeks, you kind of keep a quarter there. <laughs> this changes the definition of a quarterback. So. Okay, so how does that feel? Can you feel the difference there? So when you're standing, teach your patients how to stand. They will benefit from this. All right, go ahead and sit back down. Yes? So your definition of standing involves the change, lifting heels or changing weight onto each foot? Or She's asking if my definition of standing involves shifting back and forth. In part it does because it encourages being conscious of your posture. And what it does is that it uses more muscles. But certainly, you know, this is easy to forget and sometimes you're just standing, certainly. Now when it comes to walking, I'd like to show you a couple things. One is that when you, when a person walks who carries um, a lot of extra weight, they tend to use the least amount of muscles possible. And what I mean by this is, it could be little tiny steps going right side, left side, right side, left side. And I have to say, I, I stalk people. I follow people in grocery stores or in airports, <laughs> and I copy their steps to kind of get a sense of how they're feeling. It's amazing what, what people tell about how they, how they walk. So that actually uses the least amount of muscles in your body. But if you're gonna use more muscles, then start with, if nothing else, take longer steps. And I'll show you what I mean. So if I'm taking longer steps, then that actually, ends up, I swing my butt more. They'll feel quite awkward, don't worry about that, but it also gets the hands going in the opposite direction. So right hand, left foot, left hand, right foot. It also encourages somebody to kind of stand taller and use their lungs while they're walking. And as I say, I, I tend to stalk people. My favorite people to watch walking are people who just bought flowers at the corner stand because they're happy and they're holding these flowers and they're like cruising along, you know, kind of like strutting. <laughs> and so if you walk as though you're happy and take longer steps and breathe, then there's really joy in that process. 
in what it also does is that each step becomes a way to um, massage the spine and it helps to decrease injury so or decrease pain so we're using more muscles getting more oxygen it in itself lowers blood pressure blood sugar both and so if there's a way that you could not only tell your patients to walk more but show them how to do it they will thank you for it okay any questions right now does this make sense so I'm gonna have you practice this. Even when you walk from the building to your car, see if you can walk in a conscious way. You will forget this a thousand times. And I can tell you, the forgetting is not the important part. The important part is the remembering. So let your patients not feel guilty for not doing more. Most people feel so guilty simply for living. But if they could just um, find ways to remember this and do it more often, that would be great. Okay, let's see what else we got. Um, I want to talk about um, the rate of obesity, and obesity is defined as a body mass index over 30, which for five, somebody who's 5 foot 4 would be 175 um, pounds, for somebody who's 5'10 would be 210 pounds. Um, look what happens, 1980, there's 46 states um, with a BMI of less than 15% of the general population. Only four states had more than 15%. In 1990, there were two states that had body mass index average over 20%. In 2000, there's 30 states that have an average population uh, more than 20%, have a BMI over 30. But look at this. In 2010, there's 30, 38 states that have a body mass index average over 25%. And of those, 17 states are higher than 30% uh, BMI of 30. So, where is this going? This is not changing anytime soon. Here's another way of looking at this. This is a complicated chart, but as you can see that the rate of obesity in 1994 um, was fairly low, 2000 and 2010 uh, is increasing dramatically. And what I find interesting is the rate of diabetes and the hypertension and other conditions that follow is directly following by about five years. So um, I would also bring over here to take a look that here, this is called um, both the, the cardiac belt, or I've heard it called the diabetes belt. I would also like to point out that this is where alligators live. And so one, people, one person says that maybe alligators are causing obesity. <laughs> I'm not sure, but that's a possibility. <laughs> anyway, this chart I think is quite important. And um, so if your weight has gone up, or up in the past 10 or 15 years, just know that you have good company. But that's another reason why it's not just in theory that we're looking at this. We really need to drive this home that even, um, even losing a few pounds can make a difference. Let's look at some ethnic groups. Um, the non-Hispanic blacks, 48% um, have, are obese with a BMI over 30. For Hispanics, 42%. Non-Hispanic whites are now at 30, um, 32%. And um, Asians uh, are about 10%. But something interesting happens. In an Asian population, they tend to have a cardiovascular uh, complications from obesity at a much lower body mass index. And so actually at a point of 25, BMI of 25, then the recommendations for intervention are there um, for Asian population. This is kind of curious. In most groups, obesity is in lower income groups is proportionally higher. But in two groups, both in non-Hispanic blacks and uh, Mexican-American men, those with higher income are more likely to be obese, and lower income tend to be, um, have a lower body, in, body mass index. And part of that has to do with the work styles, that um, both um, African-American men and um, Mexicans tend to be more physically active for a lower income. There's some proportion there. OK, for the overweight patient, um, 10 pounds can reduce the risk of developing hypertension, diabetes, and other health problems by even up to um, 65%. If someone is hypertensive, weight loss can be as effective as some medications. And I found this to be fascinating, that each pound of fat requires approximately one mile of capillaries. So if a person loses 10 pounds of fat, that's 10 miles their heart doesn't have to pump. That's really significant. So what I'm asking is that you let your patients know that a small weight loss, even you know, five to 10 pounds, can have significant health benefit. Okay, encourage your patients to master the art of five pounds. 
So basically, it's half through dietary changes, half through increased varied movement, and the other half through a good night's sleep. OK, so the numbers don't quite add up, but you get the <laughs> message that it's all there. All three of those are important. Um, we do talk about having a drink. Um, we know that um, people who don't drink enough water um, are going to be more hypertensive. We also know, too, that as we talked with that sort of um, thing passing around, that truly, if it's sticky on the outside, it is sticky on the inside. Um, we know that not drinking enough water tends to concentrate on the sodium retention and minimize capillary capacity to remain open. Caffeinated drinks act as, act as a diuretic. So um, coffee, uh, so, uh, pop, um, Coke or something um, can actually help to decrease the fluid that's available. As a question about alcohol, one to two drinks per day um, can have a modest effect at lowering blood pressure. Um, a serving equals 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or one and a half ounce, half ounce of 80 proof or better. But for somebody who doesn't drink, this is not a recommendation to start. I would say that sleep is precious. This was touched on earlier today. We know that about one in three Americans have high blood pressure. About 40 of those are going to have sleep apnea. But for people who have resistant hypertension, 80% typically would have sleep apnea. Um, it's aggravated by, and it's independent of blood sugar um, the, through diabetes. So um, the American Association of Sleep Medicine recommends that all patients with hypertension or diabetes be screened for sleep apnea. And um, as mentioned earlier, that the CPAP, using the CPAP by itself, can lower um, blood pressure to some degree, and it also can lower the A1C for a person's blood sugars as much as <laughs> 1 to 1.5 percent. So it's, it's quite significant. I would ask your patients, many people are half asleep when they're awake and half awake when they're asleep. And we just want to separate those so you're more asleep when you're asleep and more awake when you're awake. And that's where um, that's an important thought. OK, let me just back up here. Yeah. OK, here's some ideas for how to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, set up a routine can be very helpful. Keeping the TV out of your bedroom can be very helpful. Or at least to cut off screen time at least an hour before going to bed. Exercising is wonderful. Getting out in the sunshine can help a person sleep better. Focus breathing or meditation is very beneficial. Um, check for sleep apnea. I would say that lying in bed saying hurry up and sleep does not help. So I would like to just right now, um, you can show your patients how to do this too, but just uncross your legs and put down your pen down and just relax for a moment. And just take a gentle full breath. And again. At this time, take a breath and just let it take a longer time to exhale. Thank you. This is always available to you. And it seems a little awkward to do this with your patients, but they will thank you for it and they will remember what you say. So see if you can bring in a very gentle two to three breath breathing practice with your patients. Um, I do want to mention there's some common supplements that people take. Um, and oh, I would say, too, be sure to ask your patients about what supplements they're on, because they may be taking some things that are directly contradictory to the medications that they're on, but it may not be known, and they won't volunteer the effort. Most, most people who, especially take a lot of supplements, would tend to kind of keep that, they feel like it's unwelcome information in a medical setting. But it's most important that we bring what used to be called alternative care, now it's being called complementary care, and that's the way it should be. So whatever it is that they're on as complementary practices, we need to know about that and have it charted so that we can make sure that these two practices or, or different approaches work together. So someone, um, or some good ones to go by, calcium and magnesium. Magnesium has specific benefit for sleep as well as for um, um, blood sugars and other components too, uh, and specifically for uh, high blood pressure as well. So um, 1,000 milligrams of calcium, 500 magnesium, CoQ10, vitamin C, omega-3 fatty acids um, are good recommendations. And you have record of this in your chart. Um, gentle breathing, mindful practice. Um, I, I ask people, what are they grateful for? You know, what's going well in their life? And many people can't really think of what goes well. They think about the problems, but ask them what goes well in their life as well. Here's one of my sources of stress. And yes, my dog is the size of an eggplant. 
Yes, he's pretty darn okay, cute. This is Lucy, <laughs> a pocket dog, yeah. Interestingly enough, hypertension versus blood pressure. When patients hear hypertension, they think too much stress. And so if you say <clears throat> you're, you have high blood pressure, that actually helps people to remember to take their medication. With too much tension or hypertension, people think, I just need to relax more. So the words that you use make a big difference there. Um, finding a right balance. Um, and then here's your powerful message. And that is, first of all, give them the assurance that they can manage this. Let them know, point blank, that you have faith in their ability to manage their condition. And sometimes outline it. You have good family support. You find solutions to your own problems. You have the resources that you need. Outline why it is that you believe they can handle your message. Uh, reflect back what they say so that they know you're listening. Whenever possible, show them what you're teaching, not just talk to them. Like, not just say, go for a walk. Show them what this is. Um, and then have them show you what they learned, whether this is how to use a blood pressure cuff correctly. And this is called a teach-back approach, and it's actually very important. Um, give written instructions at an appropriate literacy level. And patients will recall what's said in a medical office. Just make sure it's the message that you want them to take with them. Generally, people will forget half of what's being said by the time they get to their car. Okay, half. So assume that half your message will be lost right away. So drill your, your points, your pearls home. Such as hypertension is very serious. It's also very treatable. Reducing sodium is a very effective change. Uh, focus on real food. Give your patients realistic tools. Include physical activity in your recommendations. Uh, be an example for your patients. And also keep joy and flavor in your daily life and also in your patients' take-home messages. Um, I have just a half a moment. I'll run through this real quick. Here's a case study. This is a 49-year-old woman, Tracy. She's 5 foot 5 um, inches tall, 222 pounds. She has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, sleep apnea, low vitamin D. She lives with her husband and two kids who are ages 14 and 17, works full-time at a sedentary job, many lost, you know, unsuccessful diets. She likes to cook, but says she has no time for food preparation. She wants to make lifestyle changes before adding or increasing any medication. And what would you recommend? Here's a list of her um, medications. Uh, she's on hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, metformin, um, thyroxine, and also some vitamin D. So two things. First of all, what questions would you ask her? Yes? Or what would you recommend? What, what would you give to her? I'd be curious if she uses her CPAP machine, if she has one. If she's been screened for sleep apnea, uh -huh. I mean, if, she, if she's using her CPAP, she apnea, that's a very important question. Mm -hmm. Does she get up and walk? Does, does she get up and, and walk during the day at work? Does she, does she walk, walk during the day? It's a great one. Right. A lot of times people think that exercise means either going to the gym or wearing little white shorts around the high school track. It's like, no. Yes? What's her goals? What's her goals? That's an excellent question. What does she want for herself? Yes, you can build on that. Okay. Others? What does she feel her own challenges are? What are her challenges? I appreciate that. Yeah. Because she'll know for herself that either, you know, she'll say money is tight or kids have whatever problems or whatever it is. So she'll, when she identifies her own challenges, then you can use that as a, a way of a workaround. Excellent. Good. What does she do on the weekends? She says she has no time for food prep. What right. does she do on the weekends? When does she go shopping? Right. Who does the shopping? Maybe her 17-year-old can go with her dad um, to do the shopping or something like that. So those are really wonderful questions to ask. Um, but I think the couple things that you brought out is, you know, what's going on now? What are the problems? What are your goals? What are your capacity? And also, I would say, what do you love? You know, what are five vegetables that you've had in the past three weeks that you really like? Go for the ones that you like. You know, is there a way to use a crock pot or to cut veggies or these other things to make it realistic and practical? Good. Thank you very much. And when we got a couple of minutes, if it sounds good to everybody, I wanted to also extend an invitation back to our other presenters just to come up and everyone just have a chance. If there's a question, 
anyone had they still wanted. Uh, we have a couple minutes, we can maybe do a little Q&A. By all means, we, we can certainly take advantage of that if everyone's game. I would mention too that I did bring um, announcements for the Hawthorne Diabetes Group. It's just off, just south of 28th and Hawthorne. You're welcome to take this. And on my website, there's links to all of these um, different materials. So um, feel, feel free to pick up. We'll be sending you like out this about. deck, and it's yeah. got all the links to different handouts and bibliographies on here as well. So. I had a question about diets. Um, I know that in recent times there's been some controversy about the, the pyramid, the food pyramid, uh -huh. in terms of fats and that, you know, that it's kind of been flipped around? The food pyramid was changed a few years ago, so it's now, it has a pyramid, but it has a guy running up the side. Have you seen the guy running up the side of the food pyramid? Which, so I think that one actually is much better. We do know now that, we used to say that fat turns to fat, it's as simple as that. So now we know that there's good fats and not so good fats. And basically the quality oils that we're discussing here, I tell patients it's like WD-40 for your heart. So and we want to get those good quality oils in, in order to help lose weight and to improve um, metabolic function. So the fats are actually a really important part. The food pyramid, it's true that um, I think it has its strengths, but I think it's limited. On my uh, handout reference, there's some guidelines for Dr. Weil's anti-inflammatory food pyramid, which is really wonderful. And I think that's the one that more and more people are utilizing, so is, is the anti-inflammatory pyramid. Thanks for asking. So why then on your whole fat dairy on there? That was part of the um, guidelines that came out through um, the Mediterranean diet because they use whole fat yogurt, whole fat kefir. And so it's just the whole fat yogurt and kefir, not the whole fat milk. There's actually some controversy. It depends on who you're talking like a lot to about saturated that. Fat. Yeah, there's a lot of saturated there's fat in that. Okay. Other questions? Ellen? Yes? So the hardest time for my patients tends to be the last week of the month when this thing is a lot of their snack dollars and um, canned might be the only thing that they have. So I've been telling them to just rinse the, the canned vegetables with water and remove the sodium. Is, how effective is that? So the question is whether, um, if money is tight, canned vegetables are available, does rinsing um, produce, co or produce coming out of a can cut down the sodium? Absolutely. It's tremendously beneficial, yeah. yeah. It, it does refer to getting the sugar off. Yes. yes. And, and that's really a good point. And just so everybody knows, the dollar store has these plastic. I mean, I've been handing them out. I, I deliver on the side. I do the seniors, you know, just their lunches at times. For a dollar, they have these plastic. And if um, sips and it fits every size can and it's so easy. I mean, I have, you know, women with arthritis and they can flip the can over so they fill it up with water, flip it over two or three times and it just rinses it all out. So for those at a distance, they're at the dollar store they have a little um, sieve or a um, strainer that you can put on top of a can and be able to rinse off the salt as well as the sugar from canned produce. That's a really good idea. Good. Good. Additional? Okay, I guess we're good. Any other okay. questions for anyone? Let's give these guys a huge round of applause. Thank you.